The African-American legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and religion. We will explore how African-Americans who have been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity have succeeded in our society. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Percy Ellis Sutton, Chair Emeritus of the Inner City Broadcasting Company, and my brother, glad to have you with us on African American Legends. I'm today. glad to be here again. I thank you for inviting me, and I understand that uh, Congressman Rangel is going to come before yeah, I leave here today. Yeah, we're going to have part of the gang of four, you know, the watch, watch gang it, watch of four. Watch it, watch it, watch <laughs> it. Uh, that was intended to demean <laughs> us rather than to celebrate us. No, for the audience, the gang of four was Percy Sutton, Charlie Rangel, Basil Patterson, and David Dinkins. Yes, yeah, who, someone said that in derogation. <laughs> Because uh, but you, we had so much it. you had so much power, yes. or we, at least we, you perceived to have so much power. We accepted and ran with it. That's right. Yes. Well, Percy, uh, you've been here before. We've talked about the Tuskegee Airmen. We've talked about the media. And what I'd like you to do now is to reflect on the many epochs that you have participated in, beginning with the Tuskegee Airmen, where I first met you, mm -hmm. your struggles in the civil rights, your work in politics, uh, borough president of Manhattan, you work in the media, you work in business, founder of Inner City Broadcasting Company, mm -hmm. and now major investor. As you look back, which of these epochs in your life do you consider to be the most memorable? And then I'll ask you which was the most exciting, because they don't necessarily follow. The most memorable, it, it's hard to say. Uh, I'd like to tick off a few of them, but the one perhaps the most frightening and most exciting was a freedom ride that I took from Atlanta, Georgia to Montgomery, Alabama, uh, when there was such an intensity. Just the day before, a bus had been burned. The year was 1981. And I was riding along in the front seat. 1981, 1961? I'm, I'm sorry, 1961. Fortunately, we had overcome by 81. See, see what happens <laughs> as you get old? You don't know anything about that, but I'm old. Uh, in 1961, I was riding in the front seat and the people who were, we were supposed to ride in the back seat in those days, in the back of the bus, and uh, the people in the back of the bus said, Mr. Don't cause no problem, come back here with us. And, and that was heart rendering, very frankly. But then what was bad was on the outside of the bus, people were riding in open cars with baseball bats hitting the side of the car. Mm -hmm. I was afraid, but I wasn't afraid of dying. I was afraid of dying uh, by fire. Just as all my life I've been afraid of dying by fire and by drowning. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, look, I'm, death doesn't frighten me. I've got it as a death. Like Malcolm X, my client, used to say, there's a destiny for each of us. Mm -hmm. And I've always believed that there's a destiny. I just don't want that destiny to be accompanied by fire and by, mm -hmm. by water and by drowning. And as we were riding along, uh, I, it was, I was so afraid that either the bus would turn over or someone would light fire to the bus because they had gas cans and other things there with them, that the pulse, the veins in my head became as large as my finger, and I began massaging them to keep from what I thought was exploding. And finally, after all this tenseness, about an hour and 15 minutes of tenseness, we arrived in Montgomery, Alabama, and there was a large man I'd seen to my left who I perceived to be a, he's white, who I perceived to be a, <laughs> a well, so-called redneck, as was the uh, language of that time. Just as we were getting off the bus, we were in the front so we would be the first to exit the bus, and I saw this screaming crowd out there at the bus, uh, at the bus station. This man stepped in front of me and showed his credentials. He was an FBI agent, mm -hmm. and he called my name, and he called my colleague's name. He said, please, there's a hostile crowd out there. If you're going to the lunch counter, please go there as swiftly as possible. Follow me. Stay there as swiftly, as short a time as you can. Then let's move out because the, the crowd is gathering. A further crowd is gathering. I went to that lunch counter. And the lady asked me, what do you want? <laughs> and I said, uh-oh, uh, 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 
orange juice, please. <laughs> That's just the way I did it. And that lady took some hot orange juice, it was warm, put it in and slung it along the counter with it splashing all along about five people down to me. I want to tell you that was the nicest orange mm -hmm. juice I ever okay. tasted. Because I got we got out of there immediately after they served the orange juice. We had integrated the lunch counter that day. Then we went on to, uh, from there, the next morning, we, we were hitting out that night uh, because there was still this screaming, calling us by name by then. Uh, uh, and we went on to, on a plane, to Jackson, Mississippi. And it was while standing at the urinal in Jackson, Mississippi, at the airport, that we were arrested. I was arrested for being there at a white urinal, uh, in a white restroom, and my colleague, who was white, was arrested for conspiracy <laughs> to violate the laws. Yeah? And we were taken away, and we were taken almost immediately at a sort of transition at the county court, taken to Parchment Penitentiary. Now, what is Parchment Penitentiary? At that time, it was one of the worst penitentiaries in the country. It was where they beat you up with regularity, we were told. Well, there were a number of us. I found a number of colleagues in a bus that just came before us there at Parchment Penitentiary. So that was an experience of life that was very exciting, very stimulating, and very hurtful. Well, not only that, that's an experience that changed this nation. As you were talking, because I experienced some of the similar things, I didn't actually go on that particular ride, but I experienced the same kind of thing. Uh -huh. You wonder, you know, 35, 45 years later, what was in the minds of those folks who thought they were American citizens who were trying to oppress their brothers and sisters because of their color? You, you, it's almost inconceivable. I can tell to you what happened. That. One of the people who was a part of that group, hostile to us then, spoke to us, came to the city council chambers at the time of our reunion last year. In, in 2001, we had a reunion of the Freedom Riders to Jackson, Mississippi. And one of them came to speak to us. He had been a city council member in the years. And he said he wanted to come to apologize to us because it was stupid thinking, and it held back himself and a lot of other people who could have moved to accept everything, but they didn't. But he also introduced a black person who was a member of the Supreme Court mm -hmm. of the state of Mississippi, a young black person who went to school in Michigan, was on that day there to visit with us, to be introduced by this man who, was there to confess mm -hmm. and to apologize. See, so we know some of the thinking. That's one man's thinking. We know thinking. some of the thinking, but at the same time, 40 years later, it's easy to say, I'm sorry. But the mentality, the racist mentality that existed in this country for 350 years prior to the Civil Rights Movement is something that's a cross that America has to bear. And unfortunately, today, and many people, including some black people who are achieving, don't understand the nature of the struggle, don't understand that the struggle was and is about race. Yes. It's about class, but it's about race. And uh, it's almost like the religious conflicts that we try to develop, or some people try to develop between various religions. Mm -hmm. One of the things we need is spokesmen like Percy Sutton, who will tell it like it is, put it on the line, and in a sense, hold people accountable. Now, in holding people accountable, you then went from civil rights movement to holding people accountable in politics. Now, how did you get into politics, and what is your hindsight view of your effectiveness in your political career? I came out of the civil rights movement to politics. When I was a child in San Antonio, Texas, uh, my oldest brother, John, who later went on to live in Russia, uh, raise a family in Russia, uh, John had a th thing, and my oldest sisters had a club known as Spin Where You Earn Club. Mm -hmm. Now, John had come back from Russia when he organized that club, and the years I was in my childhood, he had gone to Russia to, uh, as a, as a uh, substitute for Dr. George Washington Carver, who was asked to go, and since he, my brother was John Washington, Dr. Carver's assistant, they selected my brother. 
And my brother, at the time of invasion, Germany invaded uh, uh, Russia in the city of Tashkent. Uh, somehow my brother's wife and child were killed. Uh, at least we thought the child was killed. Uh, what does that have to do with my father? My brother was ostracized. He, he was required to come back by the U.S. government. They lifted his visa uh, and passport, and he was required to come back to America. He could not get a job because they said he was a communist, and I, he was a communist. Uh, but the point is, the attitude towards communism was not good. My brother came back here and had to teach at night languages at Columbia University and at one of the high schools here at night people learning language. He was fluent in 13 languages. No. But he was a great organizer, and he got us into politics and civil rights. And so I grew up in that climate. My older brother and sister were said to be left-wingers, and uh, I have a very good story that I remember when my oldest, my, one of my older brothers, G.J. Sutton, was running for public office, running for a member of the state uh, uh, House of Representatives in San Antonio, Texas, and that area included a large white area, much larger white than black uh, Latina. It's a city of large number of Latinas, 49 percent Latinas, uh, only 10 percent blacks, and, and other groups, whites and others. Uh, he, my brother was soliciting the help of the firemen, and someone said in the audience, he said, he's a communist. Everybody says he's a communist. And the leader of the group said, I don't know whether he's a communist. Now, I'm not going to ask you, Mr. G.J., he said, but uh, all I know is you fight for your people, and that's what mm -hmm. we need somebody to fight for mm -hmm. us. And he was elected because it has said a lot to say people want someone to fight for them. And I found this, that if I could fight in politics, if I could come out and represent uh, a Malcolm X, if I could represent some members of the Communist Party, if I could represent the Baptist Ministers Conference, then I ought to do very well in politics in New York. I thought I would do well very quickly, but it took me from 1951 until 1964 to get elected to the State Assembly. Some of those years I was running other people, supporting other people, the Basil Patterson, the David Dinkins, and others, uh, and I'd been joined by Charlie Rangel, but I didn't win for all of those years. But well, everything of course, I, that was part of the competition in the Harlem community. What is you that? weren't always the most favored politician no, no, no. among them. Well, I, I was favored by Charlie Rangel and Basil Patterson and, and David Dinkins. But there's another But group. I was not. There were bigger people. There's Adam Powell and a number of other and people. And J. Raymond Jones. Uh, J. Raymond <laughs> Jones, who eventually adopted me. He was the one who was able to make me borough president of Manhattan back in 1966. Now, why do you think you didn't get a chance to be mayor? <laughs> I must just want to tell you that I remember a, a little note in an editorial. Um, Many years, in the early years that I was borough president of Manhattan, it said that borough, I think it was in the year 1971, it said Percy Sutton is the best borough president this city has ever had. In 1977, the same company wrote an editorial said Percy Sutton, when I was running for mayor then, has no constituency. What they meant was I was black. And whatever chance I had of raising money went down the tunnel. Because when the New York Times or other institutionalized newspapers or media say that you can't make it, people don't invest in people. Recently, one of the reasons to call McCall Law to is that Pataki could at will publish anything he wanted to about Carl McCall by television, and Carl McCall didn't have the answer to answer back. For example, didn't have the money, money to answer, to answer back. back. Yes, uh, thank you for this. It's, you're not as old as I am. You don't mispronounce words and substitute words as I, as I do. That's part of your humility, Percy. We really not appreciate that. Really, <laughs> by aging, uh, the uh, call McCall couldn't answer because he didn't have the money to answer. A classic example: they published some articles in the newspapers, and they were, uh, as is always a. Uh, issue in New York City. Once a newspaper says it, some television station will pick it up. And so everybody seemed to pick it up. The attack on Carl McCall saying that he wrote letters in support of people. Pataki, at the same time, didn't have to write a letter, but I'm sure he did write letters for people. He 
let his brother-in-law get hired as an architect, and nobody raised that issue. Yeah. It is a thing of life that persons in politics, no matter what the position, must, for survival, write letters in support of other people. And that's all Carl McCall did. Yet he got destroyed. His ratings dropped immediately after that. So when you don't have money, you can't thrive in politics. And one of the things I want to do, I'm beginning, as you know, a gradual, uh, maybe now it's going to be precipitous withdrawal from public life. I want to be less public. I want to gather my assets, make tax reinvestments investments initially, do my planning, estate planning, and take a much less public role. But one of the things I do want to do is I want to invest in persons in politics mm -hmm. who I think have an opportunity to make a difference. I'm not going to do it at random as I've done in the past, just everybody, the old person, said, good person, said, we'll just send you some money. No, I want to select some people around this country to invest in. I want to be supportive of strong young people. Mm -hmm. For years, my wife and I have devoted money to supporting people who want to go to college. We've, we've been say, almost godfathers and godmothers to people. Uh, I want to change that, and we're going to change that going forward. I, I digress for your, your Your direction, then, is to, because that was the next thing we were going to talk about, <coughs> the young folks. And yes. I'm not even talking about the ones who are 60. I'm talking about the ones who are 30. Yes. The young folks. And younger in uh, in our uh, community, yes, African American, young, many of them are alienated from politics. Yes, many of them feel that when they do try to buck up against the old establishment, they are not respected, they are not listened to. Mm -hmm. But the question that I want to and they ask, must not fear that, pardon me, and they must not fear the, the uh, be turned off by rejection. That's exactly the point. Yeah. The point is, what are some of the issues that some of the younger African American who have political aspirations should be targeting. Because okay. right now, it looks like the main thing is, I want to get into it so I can get some contracts and get rich. Yes. But as you know, yeah. that was not the motivation of almost all of us who were involved in the so-called movement. OK, speaking of us, let me uh, take myself in particular. I had two jobs while trying to enter politics. I volunteered to become people's lawyers, uh, mm -hmm. to get ceilings fixed, to stop the rain from coming into their house, to help them get jobs. You've got to invest in the community if you want to be a leader in politics. And invest means some invest of you and your in energy. Invest yourself in that community, That's your right. energy and your money. Mm -hmm. huh? And you cannot, you cannot be mild, you must be aggressive, and you must devote yourself to that community. Now, so many people say they get rejected. I saw a news article by a young man in the New York uh, Daily News who just recently, mm -hmm. who talked about people, the older people blocking them. And he was in the campaign. <laughs> uh, uh, there are many people, there are many people who will block you when you're trying to go forward. But if you get turned off because someone doesn't say, come in and take my job, <laughs> You're a sad sack. You've got to, willing to be willing to fight at that back. On a personal basis, it took me from 1954 until 1972. 1954, did you hear me? To win an election. And I won the election for Assemblyman from Harlem. I served as Assemblyman for two years, and through a man who had opposed me, I became the Burr Prison of Manhattan. I stayed Burr Prison of Manhattan for almost 12 years when I ran for mayor. I must tell you that in the late of an evening, when they wrote that letter about me not being able to raise money, I knew I couldn't win then. But I thought I would try to do it, my campaign, with such class, with such ability, that it would make it easier for someone to come behind me. I'd already selected that person. That person was David Dinkins. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, so young people who expect doors to open wide to them 
or the people who write about them, other people like the young man who ran out of New Jersey. He came to a city for only a short time. Cory Booker, a bright young man from suburbia whose mother and father had never had been in the ghetto. They trained him to become something, and he could have done something, and he one day will do something. But there were people who expected uh, the man who was already mayor to step aside mm -hmm. virtually so he could come in. That's not the way politics and, run. And, could, and, and never has been and never will be. I doubt it. But then will the be. question has to do with the interest. Uh, as you with know, the, the interest that the politician, uh, political aspirant represents. Yes. The Republicans have now develop a mantra that says we need to cut taxes, we need to cut governmental regulation, we need to get everybody to do it on their own. Yeah. And the Democrats, in my opinion, have not really fought back with the traditions that made the Democratic Party of the 20th century what it is. Because, as you know, the Democratic Party of the 19th century was racist. This 2002 election was the worst that I have seen. There's a man who's president of these United States, his name is George W. Bush, whose father sought to change the government in Iraq. That was how many years ago? His father did not kill the president of, Nura, of Iraq, nor did he get rid of the government that was there. And I have a feeling that this president as I heard him say one day, is committed to getting rid of Iraq by any invading means any possible. means possible. So he started a crusade. He used the 2001, September 11, 2001, bombing of the Trade Center as a good starting point for himself to launch after they found, I'm sure to say, on September 11, mm -hmm. and nobody mentioned the fact that he was missing in action. Mm -hmm for almost a whole day. His, he was hiding out. His message was that he had to be there so they wouldn't get him and he could then lead the country to its great recovery. Is that That's it? his message. Is that it? Anyway, uh, he, this man uh, was able to use that and talk about war and incite a number of people thinking what he was doing for, was for their protection and win an election. But a part of the reason he was able to win is the Democrats didn't fight back, didn't talk about economic issues, they didn't take it. Uh, it maybe it was difficult for them, but you had to see the presence of more people fighting. I would have liked to have seen somebody like uh, Mr. Clinton fight back, mm -hmm. but they didn't. And when you fight back, you have to fight back with your heart. You have to persuade people yes, that what you're saying is correct. Yes, yes. For example, the solution to all of this economic thing is to not put through the tax cut. Yes. But then so many uh, Democrats, including some African Americans, were afraid to say yeah. we need to hold taxes or raise taxes, and particularly in the crisis that the city faces today. The real question in our society... Now, I just want to tell you the saddest thing that has happened for me on a personal basis with regard to uh, the election is that Charlie Rangel, one of the best people I've ever known in politics, perhaps the best, did not have an opportunity this term, this term, mm -hmm. uh, to become chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. If he decides to stay, and I hope he does, uh, he will have a chance the next time, because I think there's going to be a revolution within the Democratic Party in the sense of fighting back. Well, not only a revolution in the Democratic Party, you know, the public itself can't be fooled but for so long. Yeah, yeah. If the unemployment lines get longer yeah. and unemployment insurance runs out, yeah. and if people get killed in a conflict, uh, I don't know whether the country would sustain this. Speaking of unemployment, one of the cruelest things to hear is a report on Bloomberg, the, the uh, financial uh, uh, radio station here is, uh, X company, stock went up 3% upon the notice of firing 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? That says something about the morality. It doesn't say something about the morality mm -hmm. of a country that fire these people, make them homeless maybe, mm -hmm. uh, and your stock will rise. The attention that we give to short-term benefits in a stock mm -hmm. as opposed to long-term, and the time we do not invest our energies, our monies, and our abilities in building long-term successes 
in businesses and community services and the various things that benefit the ordinary people. And we pay for it by having more people in jail than any yeah. of the westernized nations. Exactly. And that, of course, becomes a business, too, an upstate business in the case of New York State. Yes. But as we come to the close, uh, I'd like you to close. comment. Close? You're going to close me out already? We will. That's what the clock does. I've talked too much. Uh, like your opinion about the role of celebrities in taking stands on issues that affect African Americans. I'm thinking specifically about Tiger Woods and the uh, Augusta National <sighs> Golf Club. <laughs> Poor Tiger Woods. Uh, yeah, I help him very often, you know. I sit by that television set when he's playing. And cheer him. And I say, go, Tiger, go, yeah. Tiger. Uh, you want us. Yeah, he's one of us. He, he may not admit it. Sometimes <laughs> Tiger, uh, like originally, yeah. he didn't say he's one of us, but uh, yeah. very. American culture says he's one of us. Uh, I, I'm sorry that there are people who are afraid to take a chance. He would be uh, so much more respected if he were to take a chance on with regard to women. Now, sure, my friend Jesse Jackson said uh, that would not be required of, uh, it was not required of white people, white stars. Uh, that may be true, you see, but uh, as black people, who have been segregated for so long and are still injured by the psyche of segregation and discrimination of the past, uh, we have an obligation of coming forward and speaking out on all of these issues. I feel very sorry for Tiger Woods because as the years pass and he has more and more success, he'll always be remembered as a man who wasn't willing to step up. But of course, people out. do change. And yes, it is yes. possible that we'll, he could step up. Not it's only always that, it's possible. I'll be there helping him on the television set. And with the influence of people like Percy Ellis Sutton, I'm sure that things can change. They've changed in our generation. A lot of it has been because of you and people like you. So I just want to say you are an African American legend. Can Percy I just Ellis say this Sutton. before we? Uh, I'm looking at you here. It is years later. The war is over. World War II is over. Uh, we didn't know we were going to be touched so, here. And so is this program. All right. <laughs> Thank you, okay. Percy. Thank you. Thanks so to Percy okay. Sutton for being on. That's a good American American Legends. <laughs>